go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to today's Carolina Canopy webinar series. Today's speaker is Dr. Barbara Fair from NC State University. Um, Dr. Fair is an associate professor in the Department of Horticulture Science and a landscape specialist for North Carolina. She provides expertise to the Extension faculty and the green industry, focusing extensively on issues of landscape sustainability and arboriculture. In addition, Barbara teaches landscape ecosystem management and green infrastructure, the functional use of plants and urban landscapes at NC State University in their four year program there. She is a certified arborist with an extensive arboriculture and urban forestry background. She earned her bachelor's and master's degree from Penn State University and obtained her PhD from Ohio State University. So I'm very happy to, to welcome uh, Dr. Fair to, as today's uh, presenter. Um, I will go ahead, um, Bob, if you want to go ahead and uh, we'll get, see if we can get things started here. Um, before we get started on everything, there is a, uh, um, a poll that she wants to run just to kind of get a little bit of background from everybody. So while she's taking things over there, um, we'll do, just take a few minutes a minute <laughs> to do a, a quick poll um, just to get an idea of who's on the call. So if everybody would just take a minute or two or a second or two and uh, respond back for what your professional background is, who, what you're here, why you're attending, um, that will give uh, her an idea on who is in the audience and what information she needs to relay back to everybody. Um, so if you haven't yet responded, please go ahead and do that and we will kind of get a background um, for attendees here. Just wait another few seconds, give everybody a chance. We've got almost everybody that's responded. Um, so just take a minute, should be pretty quick and easy. Uh, um, all right, so it looks like we've got most of the respondents here. I'll just let a couple more seconds for folks to, to respond with a majority of our attendees being other. Um, I guess I didn't capture everybody's background. I apologize for that. Um, if you would like to specify what your background is, if it's not captured here on this list, you can go ahead and do that in the chat box. And that way, Barb, um, Dr. Fair can see what everybody um, is coming from. But I'll go ahead and close the poll now. Since everybody's responded, you can kind of see um, that a lot of our audience is made up pretty equally of landscape architects and, and municipal arborists with a fair number in the other file. So we've got a pretty uh, diverse group here. Um, but uh, so uh, it's a good idea to, to see where everybody's coming from. So thank you all for joining. And um, Dr. Fair, if you would like to take over, I will go ahead and hide that. And you are good to go. See if we can get her going. I might have to unmute her. Sorry. There you go, Barb. You're good to go now. All right. Now I'm unmuted. <laughs> good. Good morning, everybody. I hope you are all doing well today. I know this is a strange world these days, right? We are all online way more than we probably ever thought we would be and uh, learning online. And it's a very different experience. And Certainly at NC State, we're trying to figure out what we're going to do this fall. So we expect there'll be what they now call hybrid courses, where there will be some online content as well as some face-to-face -face, uh, kind of dealing with what are the risks uh, to everybody being healthy and staying healthy. So without any further ado, we'll talk about the landscape below ground. And I did do a little bit of this uh, last year at our annual conference, but I've changed things up a little bit. I've been trying to learn more about all of this myself and what's happening out there. As so many of you guys know, I do have a study in the ground at our horticultural field lab in Raleigh, and I'm gonna share a little bit of an update with you on what's happening with that study. But first I wanna talk a little bit about soil, right? We understand there's the three regions of the state of North Carolina and the vast majority of our state is in what we would call consider Piedmont soils, right? And you think about what the natural soils are there. And one of the things I've been hearing a lot about in the past five years, and what kind of spurred me to do the study is that we have what they call these Triassic Basin soils. 
Now, if you look at actually a map of North Carolina, it's a fairly small portion that's in Triassic Basin soils. And one of the arguments I've heard out there is it does not support plant life. I would argue that if you look at the Umstead, which is right next to the, the airport, which is where there are Triassic Basin soils, you will find that you actually can support quite a bit of trees uh, and other vegetation on that type of soil. So it is, it does grow plants, but it's when we come in and we manipulate that system in order to build, right? Whether we're building uh, you know, streets or houses or whatever that might be, we typically come in and we tear off the topsoil and, and we alter those profiles. And so one of the most common things, of course, that we do is compact that soil. And when we do that, uh, these Piedmont soils are very slow to recover from compaction. It can take many, many, many years. And certainly having vegetation on those sites to help mitigate that compaction is really important. And we'll talk about that more a little bit later. Coastal plain soils, of course, are a totally uh, different kind of system. Oftentimes they're really low in organic matter, really dry sandy soil, which makes sense, unless you're in some of those wetland areas that have really poor drainage and have a lot of organic matter because it doesn't break down very quickly. But of course they also support certain communities on those systems. And I just wanted to show you an example of the amount of wetland areas in North Carolina. It's quite extensive actually when you think about it. And so thinking about the challenges of how do we protect those areas as well as manage manage development in those spots. Mountain soil systems, of course, really steep slopes, narrow, uh, very steep wet valleys sometimes, really well-developed profiles, but again, um, low, a little bit lower organic matter. You think that they're kind of shallower soils, kind of rocky, uh, and some of those also may be somewhat peaty soils. The one thing, of course, that all of these systems actually have in common is most of them have a fairly low pH. So that means when we select plant material, we have to keep that in mind. If we don't, then we have to be willing to manage those sites for that pH. So, you know, what is an urban soil, right? There's books out there, the urban soils, they have to write a whole new book on it because it's not really the soil uh, that is native to a particular site. Because again, we've interrupted those profiles, there is some sort of modified structure. You have a lot of variability, uh, both vertically and spatially, which means, you know, from one spot in a system to another spot, you might have quite a different experience. There may be great aeration in some organic matter in one spot, whereas in another spot, you've got none of that. So you also have a modified soil reaction. Remember, everything that's happening in the soil system is controlled by chemistry, weather, and biological organisms. So when you start thinking about that, then you start thinking about the soil as being alive is a pretty cool idea. So we often, of course, have restricted aeration, water drainage. Maybe we've got too good a drainage in some places, not enough in other places. So obviously that modifies how water cycles through a system and therefore, of course, nutrients through that system. You may also have waste materials or some sort of contaminants in the soil. And that's a whole nother ball game to kind of deal with. And we aren't really going to talk a whole lot about that. Modified temperatures, meaning maybe it's the soil is super hot, especially if you're in a very urbanized area downtown, you may have much hotter systems. And of course, a hotter system means you'll have different microbial activity and maybe not the best microbial activity that you would hope for. So <clears throat> when you think about what really is a soil, I mean, picture yourself in your room, wherever you are in your home office, or maybe some of you are at your actual office. I am at home. Uh, I get to look at the birds though in the backyard, which is fun, but um, countless, like just imagine your, your room being filled with soil and you have all of these tiny little particles, right? Some really tiny, right? And imagine it's just pure surface area. So picture it as if you had layers and layers of newspapers in there. And that is sort of what a, a more clay type soil would be like, which is mostly what we have in North Carolina, other than again at the coast. And imagine all of that magical surface area because that's where everything happens, right? You've got tiny pores that allow oxygen and water to move through there, hopefully unless the structure has been altered by compaction, which is what we typically do. 
but you have all of these chemical and biological reactions taking place and they occur on all of those little surfaces. So that's pretty cool. I put this idea up here of good versus bad soil, right? A lot of times we think soil is bad, right? Where it's behaving badly. I can't get anything to grow on it. I have all this heavy red clay. And I'm sure you guys hear that from your clients, you know, from consumers or whatever, folks that are, oh my gosh, I can't get anything to grow. And I wish I didn't have so much clay. And I'd argue I like having clay because of all of that surface area where things really do happen. But we have to get away from this idea of saying this is bad soil or it's not behaving well or something's going wrong with it, right? But what can we do to actually get soil to behave well? So <clears throat> Leslie's going to pop up a, another poll question. And uh, kind of while I'm talking about this idea of why do we amend soil? On the right is a picture, and this is uh, from some of Dr. Tom Smiley's research out of Bartlett Labs, where we go in with an air spade and we try to impact as much of the rooting area as possible around a tree. And in this case, this is a lone tree, obviously something that somebody felt was a significant plant. So they've added organic matter and they've air spaded that organic matter into the soil system there. So certainly, one way to do that uh, type of uh, mitigation. So our primary goal is because we typically have compacted the soils. So we're trying to mitigate that compaction. We are trying to then, because we have compacted soil, right? And remember, compacted soil has a really high bulk density. Bulk density is simply the measurement of how densely those particles are put together by in a, in a volume kind of measurement Per, per weight, essentially. So it's looking at how much stuff can you stick together in a small area? And many soils, it depends on the type of soil that you're working with, uh, how, how compacted can it actually be, right? So that's a really important thing because you can only add so much water and compact something so much. And you often hear in terms, and many of you may be familiar with this when they're talking about building roads or whatever, they call it the proctor. And oftentimes you want to get the, the soil compacted to 95% of proctor. That means its ability to be compacted. So when it's like that, you can build stuff on it. In most cases, it depends on the texture, but you can't really grow a whole lot of plants in there very well. So we have to come in and we have to try to alter that. Now, if your goal is to actually alter the texture of the soil, and everybody remembers what texture is, right? It's the percentage of sand, silt, and clay in a soil. Percentage is the super important part of that word, and I always stress that with my students. If you leave off that word, you're not talking about texture because it will change versus a sandy loam versus a clay loam based on the percentage of each of those particles. So if you are trying to alter that, you might have to amend the soil by 50%. I used to work at a garden center many years ago and I would hear some of the folks there recommend to homeowners that you, if you have a clay soil, simply add sand. And my head would hurt a little bit <laughs> because if you simply add sand without any other directions, what do you guys think you end up with? I know you're all saying concrete, right? Yes, you're going to end up with something akin to concrete. So it really depends on how much. If you add 50% by volume of sand to a clay soil, then you're going to alter that. But remember, texture is determined by the parent material. So trying to alter that texture is a, is a tricky job. That's why I kind of have that one highlighted. So you're also trying to alter the entire rooting area if you can, right? And we know in some places, like in this picture, you've got a lot of rooting area, but in many of our urban sites, we have minimal rooting area. And what's great to see is I see a lot more communities making minimum requirements. You gotta have at least 600 cubic feet of soil volume for each tree. That's better than, than what it has been, but it's still, I would love to see it bigger, but you know we have to still build stuff. So what we're looking for is kind of creating that healthy balance between uh, beneficial organisms uh, and uh, fighting, and so because that helps fight off disease and some, uh, and so plants can kind of acquire this resistance. So why do we amend? So I'm gonna give Leslie a moment to share what our survey results are. And so I'm gonna be, I'm gonna pause here for just a second. Okay, the, I should, you guys should all be seeing the shared results there of the poll about um, 
what type of soil management requirements uh, do you typically specify? With the majority of people saying adding organic matter to the top soil and then tilling it in. Um, uh, and we had a, the second place was none of the above. I'm not sure if that means that you don't require it at all or if there's another uh, soil management technique that you do require that's not mentioned here, which is possible. Um, and then uh, a small majority, about 12% 12, 12 uh, adding organic matter deep into, after subsoiling or fracturing of the, soil, of the subsoil of some kind. Great, thanks for sharing that, Leslie. And so um, <clears throat> that it's really valuable information to understand that because it'll kind of help us guide what we talk about from here on out. But remember, uh, what y'all are doing is an age old method, right? It's been around for a long time. That's what we've always kind of done, where we've added a few inches of compost over a system and tilled it in as deeply as we possibly could get it. And uh, what, what, do we, what ends up kind of how do we do that? We usually use about two to four inches of organic matter. And when you calculate that, say you get it down to about 12 inches, you're at about 20 or so percent, obviously depending on how deep you put that or how deep the organic matter is. And when I say organic matter, this can be compost of any kind. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later because knowing what the compost is, is really important. And I don't know if you guys have heard some stuff lately, but a lot of compost has been contaminated with herbicide. Um, I don't, it seems to have become a much bigger issue. And so some folks that are getting compost for their vegetable gardens and such are, are having some issues with keeping plants alive. And that's, that's pretty serious business. So uh, that's just a, a thought, just keep that in the back of your mind. I don't know if y'all have been hearing about it or not, but in extension, we've been talking a lot about that. So <clears throat> we also then, you know, you kind of, again, as I said, you kind of till it in as deeply as possible. And that's just going to depend on what kind of machinery you're using. But keep in mind, it does, it does still have an impact on reducing the bulk density, right? Reducing compaction. It also increases what we call hydraulic co conductivity, which is the rate of the movement of water through a system. And even in a clay soil, that hydraulic conductivity, that conductivity is gonna be pretty low just because of the nature. Like again, picture yourself in your room with all of those newspapers. It's a very torturous pathway that oxygen and water and roots have to move through that system. So as, if it's not compacted, awesome. You still get movement. It's just not as fast, of course, as it would be with sand but you also get this higher porosity. So you have a little bit more pore space and we're looking for macro pores, which are the big ones versus micro pores, uh, which we get a lot of if the density is really high, but, we, but it doesn't move oxygen as well. So when you put them in and notice, I just used a couple of, of research results here, but when you amend the entire bed, right? That's amending the entire bed, not just a single hole because in, when, you're, when you're amending a single hole for a single tree, all of the research indicates it doesn't really help very much with establishment and growth over time. It really has to do with how well the plant was planted, uh, how, how well you maintain it and irrigate it after planting, and of course the species that you select. But there is certainly a species relationship to how well some plants can tolerate compaction. So for example, of course, white oak, not really one of the most tolerant of compactions, whereas Chinese pistache or something along those lines might be a little bit more tolerant. So a couple of other studies I just wanted to give you some information on. And again, take note of, of the difference in some of the or amendments that they used. The Is it sandy soil versus clay type soil, what species do they use? And that is certainly a project, trees, right? Nobody really wants to give you money to research trees because it takes so stinking long to get information from them. But I was pretty excited with my study to actually see some, some uh, results right away. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But so again, are the, is the plant growing well? What kind of what kind of organic matter are you using? You see the first one is sewage sludge. And a lot of people freak out when they hear that, but they do use sewage sludge in the Northeast quite extensively. We used it in, in Ohio. They made it actually as part of a um, soilless media for planting things. And it really actually grows stuff pretty great. So really light and airy and lots of pore space and it, it does hold nutrients. So that's, that's pretty important. So just kind of an idea and, and notice 
English oak, after three years, uh, there was still some impact from that initial application of compost. So that's the thing with trees and why we need to do research for a long period of time so that we can actually see what's going on from not just from day one, because things are certainly going to change, especially as the trees become more uh, established and move soil around a little bit better. So some of you, I think, mentioned that you do this, where you do some fracturing of the soil a little bit, and this can be done with a subsoiler. It can also be done with uh, an excavator bucket and uh, adding organic matter. So notice uh, in this particular, and this is information from a study that Nina Basic did up in the Cornell area. And I'm gonna talk about her results just in a second, but they, uh, so they spread the organic matter over the entire area and it ranged from about four to seven inches deep. Now, when you calculate that out based on how deep they actually put it, they put it to a depth of about 18 inches. That's about 33% by volume organic matter. Now, a lot, of the, a lot of the information I've read, particularly from soil scientists, is, we don't really want to go above 20% if we can help it because it so alters the water holding capacity of the soil that if you get a lot of rain like we do here, we have these long periods of, of wetness, right? And it may cause the small fibrous roots to die. Then we have a period of dryness like we've just uh, you know, kind of like, well, at least we're experiencing here in Raleigh. So those fibrous roots again die. So kind of thinking about that, you know, growth and, and death of those fibrous roots takes actually a lot of energy from the plant. And that's why we have issues with establishment and a shorter lifespan for some of those newly planted trees. You'll notice, so essentially what they do is they scoop it up with the little cool mini excavator you see there and mix it all together. They drop it back down to the ground and that kind of mixes it all together. So what they found is again, a reduced bulk density, which was the goal, you also, in these systems, there's a lot of work course now on carbon sequestration and storage. And so they found with this system, because again, you're adding organic matter, which does hold a lot of carbon, you're getting a higher carbon storage rate. Aggregate stability is really important, right? We don't want everything to be crushed because what we often see, and in some of these soils that we're putting into our landscapes that we've said we were specifying, we need this type of soil with this much organic matter, the problem is, is that it's so homogeneous across that system because we've uh, sifted it. I know that's not the right word, but but we've screened. There we go. We've screened it. And so it's all screened at about the same particle size. And the problem is, is uh, sometimes that's really too small. And so we get this really homogeneous soil mix. And then over time, what happens? Think about it. If you put all the same particle sizes in your room, it's going to be compacted over time. And that then causes problems for the plants in the long term. That's why you often will see plants in uh, parking lots or whatever that seem to go in pretty well. And then in that five year or so period, you see they start to decline. It's not just because of the soil. It's because, of course, that's a really challenging site for those plants to live in. So they also found, of course, higher nutrient levels. Now, this study was done for about 12 years and they the information that I saw, they only presented the soil responses. They did not, they might have measured it, but I don't, I haven't seen anywhere where they show that information. So, but they presume, they do mention, well, we got better plant growth. I don't know what that means. Now, um, as a scientist myself, I look at how do people do studies. And so one of the, um, one of, I think, the weaknesses of this study, and I'm not certainly bashing uh, Nina Basic, uh, she's awesome, but one of the weaknesses I see is they only did two treatments. They had an untreated, which means they did nothing to the soil. They left it as they found it. Um, it wasn't compacted necessarily, but it, it was just left alone, no added organic matter. And then they did this one treatment where they added 33% by volume. So I hope your question as well as my question is, well, what would have happened if you'd only added 20%? Because remember, we look back at our age old method where we're only, we're adding less than 20% oftentimes, we're still getting an impact in the quality of the soil and plant growth. So 
I don't know if any of you guys have done any projects lately where you have asked for a mix of new soil and how expensive that can be and certainly adding a lot of organic matter, the cost of the compost as well as the cost of delivery can be quite expensive. So oftentimes I think that's why we continue to use the age old method because we don't have the money to do some of these extra processes. But uh, so kind of keep that in mind in this study is what would have happened if they'd only added two to three inches of organic matter. So something, you know, at that lower end, at that four inch depth rather than the seven inch depth. And that can be pretty significant in cost. So I gave you the citation down there. Um, I put Basic's names in or there are quite a few other authors there, but it's in Urban Forestry and Urban Greening, May 2017, volume 24. And I think actually if you Googled uh, urban forestry and urban greening, you can find that information. It's not, you don't have to be a member or whatever, which is true, true of the, of the Journal of Arboriculture and Urban Forestry, where you find a lot of this information. The one thing that keep in mind there is if you're a member, which is great anyway, but if you're a member, you get access to all the publications. If you're not, they have archives that you can go look up different information. So the last method I want to kind of talk about today is this idea of soil profile rebuilding. And this is based on work that Susan Day, Dr. Susan Day, who was with the was with Virginia Tech, who is now, I think, in Canada or out northwest somewhere, uh, helped develop along with Nina Basic. So these are some methodologies that they kind of came up with and have done quite a bit of research on. So you could certainly Google her name. Uh, you could go into some of those archives at uh, uh, ISA and find some of this information. But so their idea is spreading a four inch depth across the entire area. And again, that's about 25 percent uh, organic matter. So they use a backhoe to incorporate that a little bit deeper. But the difference in this methodology is they also then come back in and add a layer of topsoil and then till that in. So by doing that, they're trying to recreate, that's why they call it so, soil profile rebuilding, the idea of the soil profiles that are natural, that we displace when we go in and actually do our construction activities. And then the key, of course, is to plant something on that. Uh, because that's going to help stabilize the soil, going to help mitigate, uh, mitigate erosion uh, and help rebuild these kind of uh, soil uh, root channels throughout that system. So that's how we get more organic matter in the system. We get better movement of water and oxygen through there. So we know a lot of projects uh, implement like require this entire soil, soil replacement. So things are completely excavated, all of the existing soils are removed and replaced with sort of what they call these recycled or blended soils, as I mentioned before. And the study that I did uh, had 30% by volume compost added to it. It's the similar project at the airport and at the uh, art museum. And so you have to be really careful about what kind of materials you're using because if you have a really high sand content in those, then you get a really low water holding capacity. It's easier to work with potentially, but you're gonna have uh, potential drought stress if you don't irrigate plantings. And of course, I think a lot of us don't irrigate plantings and we try to get away from that because right now, of course, our only source of water is potable water. And that's that really is not a very sustainable use for that. But if we can you know, use non-potable, that's a little bit different story, but we don't have purple pipe everywhere yet. So I keep hoping for that day. So the issue though is, is that when you create that, how deep do you remove that soil from that system? If you're only removing a couple of feet of that, you're gonna have that kind of sharp transition at the bottom. And one of the things I wanted to mention, remember anytime you take a bucket, uh, from a, a backhoe or an excavator or whatever, and you scrape that soil. And that's one of the things they found with the physical fracturing and sometimes why subsoiling doesn't have a longer term effect than we want it to, because wherever that subsoiling happens, wherever that bucket hits at the bottom of that, you create kind of what they used to call a plow pan, right? So you create this zone of compaction. 
So it doesn't do well, it doesn't move through that soil system. Uh, water and oxygen don't move very well through there and you can create kind of what we call this bathtub effect in those, um, in those situations. So we wanna be really cautious about how we do that. So soil rebuilding kind of creates, uh, as I said, what they call these veins of compost deep into the soil profile. And that's kind of what we're, we're trying to accomplish. It creates those root channels and it allows soil aggregates to form over time, right? Every time we, we till something, we break up soil aggregates and it's those aggregates that help hold roots help hold water, oxygen, nutrients, right? Uh, and allow in between all those little systems for, um, for microorganisms to do their kind of thing. So I think Leslie, we, and I probably should have done it earlier. I think we had one more poll question for you all that was asking if you actually do these, these any of these activities, what happens? What do you think happens? Do you get any kind of, response. And I'd love to see if you say yes, I'd love to see in the chat where you tell me what you see, what you truly see is happening with your plants over time. Do you see a benefit of adding uh, organic matter to your systems? And particularly if you do both, if you do kind of the age old method and you do one of these two newer methods, are you seeing a better response from one of these newer methods? Does it seem like it is worth the cost is kind of what I'd be asking you. So I'd, I'd love to hear from y'all. And if you don't want to respond in chat, you could certainly email me. I have my email address at the end of the presentation. So the whole idea here, of course, with doing any of these is to improve tree establishment, improve how fast they, not how fast, but improve their growth rates of, you know, get them established quickly as possible and growing instead of just kind of sitting there stagnantly. And of course, improving soil permeability for a couple of different reasons in these soil profile rebuilding techniques are, are really a valuable tool in stormwater management as well as um, increasing again carbon storage in those soil systems. So some sites and again this is information from uh, Susan Day's work there are some situations where it's really not uh, good and those of course where we're trying to, to do something. So <clears throat> If you have a site that has really compacted soils, obviously that's what we're looking for. Uh, depending on how compacted it is, you may or may not see a huge difference. Um, <clears throat> if it's not overly compacted, adding all of that may not be an issue. So certainly doing a site evaluation ahead of time to see how compacted it is. And there's a few different ways that you can do that. They have what's called cone penetrometers, which are, there are handheld models, which are probably good enough for what we wanna do. Uh, just to go out and kind of check a few spots and see how compacted the soil really is and do what do we need to do. So again, being able to protect those sites from continuous activity later. If we can't guarantee that, then we have wasted our time and our money in creating these uh, new, hopefully new profiles. Uh, where you don't have any topsoil, uh, we need, of course, you can bring no, new topsoil in and certainly in those situations, but uh, obviously, again, that adds a, a little bit more money. So if you're starting a new project, that's where you can say, all right, we, we're taking the topsoil off, but we're storing it on the site. So obviously, if you have large trees, because you can see how all of this activity is going to cause issues for <laughs> destroying roots of the large trees that you probably are wanting to save, <clears throat> excuse me, and protect. So you probably have big fences around those, hopefully. So some places where it might not be best is if you've got really a really low or a really high pH, because now you have chemistry happening and that chemistry will determine how things aggregate, how which microorganisms are going to function best. And remember, what is that magic pH, right? It's at 6.5, but in that zone. So things, and we're talking really low or really high here. So, and if those are things are happening, you've got a lot of other issues as well. Like what are you even gonna grow on those sites? Certainly heavy metals and pollutants are another thing to factor in. If you have uh, a site that has been contaminated, then you're probably gonna need to do some remediation there. Uh, before you can even really think about planting things. Again, if you have an impermeable layer below that 24 inches or so, which is what you're trying to dig down to, 
because it's super important that we have the ability to move water and nutrients down through that system. Not that they're gonna help the trees necessarily, but we don't want water kind of hanging out in that top zone. Uh, and if you don't have a very good soil texture, uh, because remember, we're trying to work with what we have in those sites, not trying to recreate something completely new. So remember, I mentioned at the outset that you want to think about, well, what kind of organic matter or compost are you using? And you want to make sure that you're using the right stuff. The carbon to nitrogen ratio simply means how much carbon is in that particular compost versus how much nitrogen. And you want to make sure that is less than 20 percent because uh, once you get more than that, you end up with a nitrogen deficiency potentially in the soil. Now, that can certainly be mitigated by adding fertilizers if you need to, but again, we're trying to minimize the amount of stuff we have to do here. So you want that pH again between 6 and 7.8. I'm not sure if they've done some research that says above 7.8 or what, or above 7, you have issues. Um, and it has that compost should have greater than 50% organic matter. Remember, compost can be many things. It can be sewage sludge. It can be sawdust. It can be cotton fibers. It can be obviously manure so or leaves. So a lot of different things can make up a compost. It can be bark. So kind of keep those things in mind when you're putting together what kind of compost. And I would suspect certainly uh, if you can look, she does have some specifications for this. And let me go back just a second um, to show you again, the, this website at the bottom of this page, that is where you will find the specifications. And um, I can get that put up on the chat for you if you want that at some point, or you can certainly email me to ask me that, or you can just Google Susan Day uh, soil profile building and you will find that information. So on that site, she talks about the specifications in very specific ways and how you go about doing these projects. So I'm just giving you a big overview of that. Um, again, the right amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus, and that's certainly going to depend on what the pH is of your site, what kind of soil are you working with, are you in the mountains, the Piedmont, the coast. Uh, <clears throat> Again, stable and mature, that means it's not going to break down very quickly. It's going to take a long process, so it's going to be present in that system for a long period of time. There are certainly composts that you can add that have breakdown very quickly, and then those that are a little bit slower, so you have a nice mix of things over time. And obviously, uh, not very phytotoxic, meaning that there's nothing going to happen uh, to the plants because you put them <laughs> into this um, into this fresh compost, so to speak. Obviously, no weed seeds or pathogens, and you have, you know, you know who's supplying it. It's somebody that's been out there. So, you know, what they expect to come of all of this, of course, all of this is you're going to get better growth of plants, right? They're going to have better establishment of the plants. You're going to have uh, increased tree growth rates. Hopefully, it's going to be better. And of course, you're going to do all of those things that we've mentioned before with the soil. You're going to decrease the density, you're going to increase permeability, and you're going to enhance uh, aggregation and then that long-term carbon storage in that system, which again is what our kind of overall uh, view of what we're trying to do in many of our urban areas these days. So the thing is, of course, this never happens in isolation, right? There's a lot of factors that play into this. One of them certainly is the environment. How does the environment interact with the plant? What is the fertility of the soil, the climate, and the rainfall? Because every topsoil is not going to be created equal. So really, as I mentioned earlier, really how good your response is may, may be based on how bad the situation was. If it wasn't horribly compacted, you might not see a big difference. You might just see they're, oh, they're chugging along, they're doing okay, they're, they're thriving. Um, but one of the things to kind of keep in mind here, and uh, if any of you guys work with stormwater management, this is obviously a hugely important issue now and will continue to be in our urban areas over time. And we're still trying to figure out how trees fit into this system. I, you know, I've been working with Bill Hunt. We're hoping to put together a fact sheet on using trees as in stormwater uh, best management practices. They call them something else now. I don't know. They keep changing names here and <laughs> everywhere. So 
Um, I don't think they call them best management practices anymore, but we know what we're talking about. So they're finding, uh, they're doing some studies, but they're looking again at very small quantities of trees because they take so long to grow and these studies are often fairly short lived. So how do trees really impact that? Do we want to put a lot of trees into our stormwater systems? And I would argue, no, we probably don't. Uh, how many is enough for a certain system? But again, this comes into how well can we rebuild our soils? And you're looking at creating, uh, using these plants and using the soils in these bioinfiltration cells. Uh, you guys, of course, know about civis cells. How can those be used? Uh, remember, the goal of stormwater management is to get, nit obviously, is to collect water, but move water through and clean it. So we're trying to get the nitrogen and phosphorus out of those systems. So they're thinking about things maybe in a very different way than trying to get plants to survive or trees to flourish in those sites. So the cool thing is, is this kind of idea of soil profile rebuilding can really help improve the soil that you have at the site, right? If you're increasing soil permeability and infiltration, this is gonna work really well. But remember, it's only as good as that top layer. So you have to have vegetation on the top, some sort of ground cover or mulch and a good mulch. Uh, keep in mind, triple shredded hardwood bark mulch we use everywhere, although it crusts over. So you're not necessarily getting good movement of water and oxygen into those soil systems. So, <clears throat> You have to think about what is the least permeable layer in this system that we've built. If we can't get, if, if the surface so, uh, is sealed, that's the surface of the soil system is sealed, you're not going to get water and oxygen into that system. So it's not going to work all that well. So making sure that you have really good surface permeability is hugely important. And again, that's why we don't want to go back in there and cause any kind of new compaction. So, you know, I, Love the idea of plants. <laughs> Obviously, I'm an arborist and a horticulturist. The idea of, of what I have I jokingly call the mismulching of America. <laughs> we are obsessed with mulch in this country. And um, it's like mulch is the landscape. And some of you may have heard me use the terminology that mulch should be the underwear of the landscape. You should, if you want to wear it, cool, but hide it. Right? <laughs> we don't need to see it. Uh, and obviously that's very tongue in cheek, but the point is, is we, we don't want to have just seas of mulch and that's often what we do. And I've seen some really great plantings in my travels throughout North Carolina, even with things like the ryope. I know a lot of us hate that, it's not a native plant, but it does cover the soil and it does survive in some pretty terrible places. I know, I know Zach is on the call and I know on, um, Mon what is it, Monroe Street, I think it is. They have a bunch of, la of uh, lace bark elm planted and they have on one side of the street, they have uh, them with nothing. I think it's brick or something. And on the other side, they have liriope underneath them and those trees seem to be doing better. Now, I'm not saying that's the only reason for that because there's certainly different exposures. One's more out, one's closer to the building. But again, we need to think about these things differently because we need to look at them more as a system than just throwing plants in the landscape uh, and hoping they survive, right? So a lot of folks are talking about biochar, right? Biochar these days and how to add that. I know some work has been done at Bartlett. Kelby Fight did some work there and they did find some, certainly some benefits from adding biochar. It can be what you would consider your compost material. And certainly it improves, again, a lot, all of these physical properties we've talked about the soil and it can actually help increase disease resistance in plants partly because it's increasing the beneficial organisms. And anything you can do, any of these uh, amendments can help resist biotic stressors if the root system is doing really well. Up to a certain point, right? We cannot control the weather yet. So uh, we're still going to have too much rain, not enough rain, too much heat. And especially in those really challenging urban areas, everything is magnified, uh, so to speak. So what I've read about is adding biochar and compost can really uh, work well together. So this is one of the studies and you can see kind of what I was saying, again, increased soil quality, surface, uh, soil surface area, 
And certainly all of these things would be fairly true of what we talked about with any kind of compost adding, if you're adding the right amount. The one issue uh, is it may increase the pH of the soil. And that's the, the, just the nature of the product itself. That's why understanding the compost that you're using is really important. And uh, because of that, that you can also immobilize nitrogen, which is a pretty important issue. So, you know, this picture just gives you an idea. There are many different particle sizes of biochar, uh, mixing a few together. I know that from my conversations with some of our friends at Bartlett, they don't often do biochar amendments anymore. And as you might imagine, one of the reasons is it is super dirty. And uh, they're because they're often using an air spade to incorporate it into the soil. So you get a lot of black dust to blow in everywhere. So <clears throat> I don't know how much they're still using it. Um, <clears throat> Again, they found that, yeah, of course, you might get a, a good increase in plant biomass, but it may not be right off the bat. It may take time. And that's the thing. Again, trees, time. Right. We, I think we all kind of got that. But uh, certainly it doesn't only affect the plant. It does affect uh, the growth of, of the plants themselves. I mentioned biosolids before, or sewage sludge. Biosolids sounds a little bit better than sewage sludge, I guess, to most people. Um, I've worked with it, I have. I planted my trees in that to grow them before I put them out in the field for my PhD study. It doesn't, there's no smell. It is totally inert, and it actually is a really awesome component in a, um, in a soilless media for growing in nurseries. And so, you know, they found in a lot of different situations where it actually did. And notice the same author for that first citation is the biochar, because they did use biosolids as one of the treatments they were looking at to see how well does that work as well in comparison to biochar. So again, depending on what plant you're looking at, how much of an increase that did you get in growth, um, in some cases, when they incorporated biosolids, they had negative impact on Quercus ilex. Okay, that's one species of tree. To me, that doesn't mean it's not something that we couldn't try, certainly in many different circumstances. So <clears throat> something to think about. Biostimulants, these pictures are straight off of the internet. Uh, as a scientist, I, again, am always, I wanna see data. I wanna see research results often. I wanna hear a good story that leads me to think this is an idea that I wanna explore a little further, either do my own study or research it more. And this is one of those areas that I have found uh, a lot of information that's maybe not supported by data. By the way, that should be sugar beet and not sugar bet. <laughs> but uh, so they, they incorporated vitamins in it, uh, some basic elements. Uh, sugar beet extract, sea kelp. Uh, so in some ways, I kind of jokingly call these the moon juice uh, effects. And I'd still get a lot of people call, calling in or emailing me asking me about these kind of special stuff. And I guess there is a product out there called moon juice, uh, something along those lines. I would say the one ingredient in this that probably does have some impact are the humic acids. I'm not saying they don't work. Um, I'm just saying to be skeptical, to be reasonably skeptical. Uh, so they're hoping that, of course, you're going to activate more soil microbes, increasing plant vigor, improve color. Uh, does it work? Yeah, I don't know. There are some studies that say no, not, not, it did not really affect trunk or shoot growth. Uh, it did increase chlorophyll content, which isn't a bad thing. But it, and it also increased leaf area and dry weight. So it did increase some biomass. But again, is it worth the expense of doing that? This is a little product called Super Thrive. And you can see it does include kelp. I don't know how they ever, I always am always curious about these things. How did they ever say, all right, we're going to create this magic joy, joy juice and we're going to add sea kelp to it. Uh, always kind of a cool thing to me. Mycorrhizae, certainly you guys know what mycorrhizae are. I'd be curious how many of you guys use mycorrhizae and if you wanna put that in the chat, yes, you do. And yes, you see effects from that. When I worked as a regional urban forester in Ohio many years ago, it was, it was coming out into the market pretty significantly back then. And I don't hear quite as much about it these days. I think people probably do certainly still use it, but there was a lot of mixed information out there. There was not a lot of research that said adding mycorrhizae increases uh, tree establishment, or if you have trees that are 
stressed by adding mycorrhizae, you're going to have less stressed trees. Uh, there's also the, the idea of um, <clears throat> when you first develop a site, if you add mycorrhizae, you're gonna increase root growth. Uh, my question is, if you have a terrible soil, you're not supporting much of anything, including mycorrhizae. Now the spores may be in there and they may remain dormant for years until things start, you get more you know, biological activity from other organisms and tree roots as well. So you gotta have the whole system to support mycorrhizae. They are a living organism. But some of the research shows that they do, you can get an increased root and caliper growth. Um, <clears throat> and this just shows they're doing a soil injection that includes mycorrhizae as well as some other nutrients at very low concentration. So very low nitrogen. So kind of like a liquid slow release fertilizer in these situations. And I don't think oftentimes companies call them uh, fertilizers. They kind of stay away from that terminology, but they found that you get a reduced transplant shock and again, a resistance to environmental stress. I think if we have good soil, we have good plants and we have good mycorrhizae uh, growth as well. So again, knowing the species of mycorrhizae that goes with the tree species that you're using, and it really depends on uh, the species of mycorrhizae, how good of a response you might get from the plant. So again, what are the cultural practices that we're implementing to plant our plants in is certainly going to affect whether or not you'll have growth and, and survivability of that. So I mentioned before about the amount of organic matter. I just want to reiterate this just to be sure. Um, it depends again on the type of organic matter that you have. It depends on your soil texture and what are your goals? What, why are you adding any kind of amendments to the soil? And you see, I gave you a huge range, five to 30%. And remember, the research I've seen from soil scientists is getting over 20% starts to negatively affect what's happening. So if you keep it in that 20%, again, are we going to have good response? Would we have the same response if we added 33%? Would it be significantly different enough to say it's worth going higher number or not? So again, you know, I encourage you to try some of these different values. Try a 10%, try a 20% in some of your projects and see what happens. No matter what you do, you're going to get those benefits. So uh, keep that in mind. Again, don't exceed that 30%. I just wanted to show you that. Your aim, and this is, remember, I mentioned bulk density. So you have this weight per volume calculation. And Philip Kroll is the guy who wrote the book on urban soils. And it is a very technical book. I have not been able to get through it. Not good nighttime reading, <laughs> fall asleep pretty quickly. So again, this is a range uh, that allows you to grow really good plants. Uh, the range, so to give you an idea, concrete has a bulk density of two. So uh, we're trying to grow plants, right? So again, we know all these things. What are we trying to do? What are the objectives of why we're adding compost to our soil systems? So I'm not gonna go over that again. But one of the things I wanna reiterate is how, if we're protecting trees, we're protecting soil. So how can we do better in protecting soil in some of these developing areas? I know it is a crazy idea to not go in and do mass grading. It raises the cost of everything. But is it is it something possible? Certainly it is going to be something that actually will work where we don't have to move as much soil. Can there be a cost uh, breakdown that says, yeah, it's actually less expensive to try to protect soils in some of these situations than creating all these new soils or doing all of this soil profile rebuilding? How can we protect the soils? So I know that's probably a pipe dream on my part, but <clears throat> again, managing, uh, managing moisture and fertility is hugely important once those plants are in the landscape making sure we've got good drainage. Species selection, hugely important. Species have very various tolerances to compacted soils. And this is a Chinese pistache. Yes, it's not native, but man, it's a tough little tree. So can will that do better in a compacted soil? Absolutely, than some of our native species. Uh, but again, what site, how much soil? Do we need to do a complete replacement or can we do some rebuilding? So if we can give the trees more space, and again, I love this because look, 
there is not that much mulch showing here, right? You've got all kinds of plants. This, by the way, is in Portland, Oregon. We can have that here. Um, the rain is different there. It doesn't get quite as hot, but we can still do that here with the plant species that we have. Look at this. This is the Northeast United States. Uh, big trees, not even in that huge a space, but certainly sufficient space. And even in competition with turf grass, they're doing amazingly well. These are some trees at uh, up at UNC, I believe, and this is actually a stormwater uh, structure, a BMP, and these are, of course, bald cypress, and look how well they're doing. So not a whole lot of soil under there, but sufficient soil to get these trees to grow really well. Again, another picture from Portland. They created these gardens in downtown Portland, and I, we see that here. We can do that. We can do that really, uh, really well. Even though you might not like the species, this is Firepower Nandina. They have a lot. They have some amazing tree species and shrub species in that. So to finish up, I had mentioned last time about this designer research study that I put in, and, and I had two treatments, and one is just, again, the age old technique of adding a couple inches of compost. Uh, in this case, it was composted leaf matter and I tilled it as deep as we could get it and that was eight inches deep. The other one is I created these planting beds. I dug out all the soil and put that in there. Now, I created a bathtub to some degree here, but the soil that these were planted in is a really, is a sandy loam. So this, the drainage is very good. But the, the areas where we had the 30% by volume or, uh, organic matter or designer soil, as I call it, uh, was very, very wet. When it rained, it was quite wet. And now, and I'm afraid I don't have quite a recent picture, but the trees are quite a bit larger. This is only two years later. They are probably twice the size, at least the uh, platinus acerifolia are, are twice the size. They do not seem to be as impacted as the trident maples. So you can even see in this picture, and this is the straight, um, this is the just the normal soil treatment. This is the designer soil. And what you notice is the trees are, uh, the canopies are much smaller. The, the color of the foliage is off. This was the first year. This was within the first three months. So you can see where we have discoloration, early fall uh, defoliation and on the, on the uh, trident maples and uh, certainly a little bit off color. Now these have grown better. These two trees are still about the same size in 2020. So certainly uh, there is an impact and it does seem to be related to species as well as to the soil treatments. So even though the platinus have grown, those in the designer soil are not growing quite as well. So again, uh, kind of what we're seeing there, you can see quite a bit of difference in those trees. So you can see where we've got great color here in the back, not so good. So, and this of course is probably weird, but as a, as a researcher, like I hope that it, we have a drought because we haven't had a drought since I've installed them, at least not an extensive drought. And I'd like to see how that impacts that designer soil. We know that being really wet and holding moisture for a long period of time is problematic, but what about when it really dries out? So the bottom line is do what you can with what you got. Um, if you have the budget, I'd say certainly try the soil profile rebuilding. It seems like the best option that we have. I prefer that certainly over trying to use some of these designer soils. I think they are incredibly cost prohibitive. Uh, the project at the art museum, uh, the soil alone was a million dollars. So uh, that's a big expense. And um, if it works, great. If then you've then it's been worth uh, the investment. But you know, learn about your types of soils that you have in your areas. What is the structure like? Is it compacted? Go in and measure those things, or have the person who's doing the project measure those things. Think about what species are really going to be best for those sites. I know there's a lot that goes into deciding what species to use, and and learn about the quality and types of organic matter that you're using. Uh, certainly are really important. So I really want to thank you guys for your time. I hope you got something out of it and I hope that you stay well and happy and healthy over the next, however long all this, forever, right? Uh, there's my uh, email address if you wanna chat with me. 
uh, at any time. So I am happy to turn things back over to Leslie. Yeah, thank you, Barb. Um, so what we've got, we've got um, about 15 minutes or so for questions. We did have some um, comments come in about mycorrhizae uh, while you're talking about that, Barb. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know if you can see them in your question box on your side, but um, quite a few comments. One saying uh, that they've not used mycorrhizae because they work on large sites and it's not very cost effective for that situation. Right. Um, Another person commented that uh, he uses mycorrhizae on stress trees and, and trees that have not lost root area, and it seems to be helping those. Um, okay, that's great to know. Yeah, I don't, I can't see the answers or the question okay. portion, I that's guess. Um, so, and then, yeah. yeah, and then Marianne Metcalf said that when she was working in Wilmington, she used mycorrhizae on laurel oak and magnolia trees, and they had very good results for, for those. So there's a lot of varying degrees of the use of mycorrhizae. We did have one gentleman that posted a good blog on, um, on a, sorry, I'm trying to find it now, because uh, I was going to put it in the, in the chat box, um, the podcast on biosolids. So I'm going to put that in um, so that everybody can view it, and it's a, a podcast to everybody. So if there's a, a, any folks on the that are attending that would like to, to hear more about that, um, I'll put that out there for everybody. We have had a few questions come in. I'm going to um, try to get back to my screen real quick while we're doing it, just so that people have something to look at. Um, and here we go. So, um, but uh, so if everybody would just take a few minutes, if you've got questions, go ahead and post them in the, tr in the question box and I will we'll get to them. We do have time for that um, here. So I'm going to kind of go back and uh, go back in time, Barb, and <laughs> get you to think back on a couple of these things. Um, we had one question come in saying that you mentioned 600 cubic feet of, feet of soil for rooting has been better, but not good. Can you discuss what would be optimal guideline for a given canopy spread and what's practical in new and infield development? All right, that's a great question. Uh, um, certainly more is always better, uh, but I understand the limitations. And um, I think you get a reasonable growth of most species, meaning you get a fairly good height and canopy spread in a 600 cubic feet. Uh, remember, go back to Jim Urban's uh, information on how much uh, height and caliper growth do you get based on the volume of soil that you provide. So the more you provide, the better off you are. And you can see that in many situations where you have uh, trees growing, let's say, in tree cutouts on one side of the street and larger spaces on the other side. It's evident the same species is certainly going to grow much better in those larger sites. The key is that it's not just about that, right? The key is it's about what can you get your community to agree to and, uh, and still allowing for all of the development that needs to take place uh, in, in communities. So it is a balancing act between how much space can you legitimately give trees, because certainly uh, the, the more space you're going to have other issues, especially if they're in sidewalk cutouts. So, you know, I know that the city of Raleigh certainly uses, uh, and I use them as example, that's where I live and I see a lot of stuff there and they're doing a lot of cool things there. You, you know, with the uh, structural soils that they've used in the past, uh, you know, you create a large area underneath the concrete, but remember those are expensive. Uh, structural soil, I don't know if the price has gone down recently, but that's in the $15,000 per tree range, somewhere in there. If you do civicels, you're at 20 plus. So many communities can't afford those things. So where in other places can you give it more space, but still allow for the infrastructure that needs to happen? Uh, so and what trees will do better in those sites. So you have a 600 cubic foot area, you could get a full size pistache potentially. Are you gonna get a full size maple? It depends on which maple. Trident, probably yes. Red maple, probably not. Uh, and that's for other reasons though, as you guys know, too hot, uh, too dry oftentimes. So it is really, I would love to be able to say, here's your answer. 
uh, but it really is dependent on what are the goals, what can you get your communities to agree to, and uh, certainly, you know, you think about a parking lot space, we have so much parking in so many places, right, that's required by, uh, I don't know if it's required by regulation or how they determine how many spaces that you need, and, and it goes, of course, with what do the developers want, and you have to think about you know, I think of a Walmart shopping center that is never full, right? How could we have made that a better place for trees to grow and more inviting for people to actually want to go there because we've created bigger spaces? And, and you know, I know I've talked about this and I have a certain probably naive concept of it, uh, what I think would be ideal uh, and what we can have happen. But I think if we start thinking out of the box, can we incorporate some of these stormwater ideas? Because there are potentially ways to get money from those stormwater projects. So I probably didn't give you the exact answer that you're looking for, but I hope I at least gave you a little something to think about. But definitely check out Jim Urban's work because you, he'll get, there's a chart of, you know, where, where do you maximize the height of that plant, the potential growth of that plant with the amount of soil that you provide? All right, great. We have a few questions that have come in. Um, one, um, so Lisa Cutshaw asked, um, I, and I have a feeling it's back when you were talking about the, the tilling in of the, of the organic matter, asking how do these compare to the no-till methods? Okay, right. So, you know, when you think about farming and we talk about agriculture on a broad scale, they talk about no-till and or conservation tillage versus um, tilling, right? And remember I mentioned when you till, you create a plow pan at the base of wherever that tilling line is, how deep you can till right below that. It's just the nature of tilling. You create a plow pan whenever you do that. And so, uh, you create a very different environment for soil organisms and such. And in some of these no-till systems, you actually have a little bit higher compaction, which makes sense because you're not doing anything. It's just the nature of whatever that soil type is. But you're also not disturbing aggregation. You're not disturbing the microbes. Uh, and so you have a, a greater opportunity for better soil building over time in those no-till systems. So um, again, if you're just to add, like in these urban sites, if say if you were to just add organic matter or mulch even, and Tom Smiley out of Bartlett again has done a lot of this research on soil amending. And his study found that by adding some organic matter on the surface, and again, add plants, <laughs> let's not just have a sea of mulch, um, but that is going to help as well. So even if you don't till, you will get some impact. Remember though, this is a super long process and even that soil profile rebuilding, it puts things all where they should sort of be, except you've got compost down a little deeper than it would normally be in a soil profile because that's normally the top layer. But you're, you're moving things around a little bit and you're altering that system. So uh, how well it works is gonna depend on how well you do things and how well you kind of take care of the top of that system, if that makes sense. So there are there are drawbacks to tilling uh, because again, you break up soil aggregation and structure to some degree, but it's kind of, again, that balancing act. Okay, we have a couple more minutes. I'll try and get to a couple more questions. Um, Matthew Evans asked if you had any resources on the carbon sequestration amount. Oh gosh. <laughs> um, all you got to do is Google David Nowak. Uh, I, they didn't, they, in those studies, and if you actually uh, Google Nina Basic, you can find some, you go to her homepage. She has this information on this uh, soil, this soil project that she did that I shared with you back in the beginning. And in that is a list of publications below that. And so, uh, some of them are PDFs that you can click on right away, and some of those have information just for those studies. Uh, in the introduction, they might have a little bit more. Just looking at their references, you can often find where they got information and how they find, found out something that they shared. But they have a little bit of information on the increase of carbon storage. So does she from her 12-year study in that soil uh, assessment that I talked about. So 
David Nowak, you know, from the uh, Urban Forest, uh, the he's not Urban Forest, he's the USDA Forest Service uh, researcher. He has done a ton of information studies and gathering information on carbon sequestration and storage. And if you you could wade into that and be deep in there for years. There's a ton of information out there. And I think they do have some that's more focused on the Piedmont too. So you might want to even focus down on some of that work. Him and uh, what is it? Greg McPherson, I believe, is the other guy who's done a lot of that kind of work. So that's, uh, I'd start with Nina Bassick though. Yeah. Uh, another question, we have time for maybe one more. Um, can you expand on the permeability issues with shredded bark mulch? Right, so what I typically see, even if you put down the right amount of triple shredded hardwood bark mulch, because of the nature of that material, it kind of clumps together. So if it is, if it dries out, right, it sort of forms this network of fibers that are uh, crust over. So it becomes really difficult for water to move down through that system. So if you have plants that are planted a little high, you will see water move off of that system because remember bark is hydrophobic. It repels water until it gets really wetter. Once it gets wet, it's easier to keep it wet, right? That makes sense. So when that bark dries out, you get that crust forming and that really uh, minimizes how much water uh, in particular can move down into that mulch. So um, that would be certainly something to keep in mind. Uh, you know, one of my favorite mulches is leaf compost. There's nothing wrong with that, but it breaks down really quickly. So you could certainly do what a lot of cities are preparing, right? They have the wood chip mulch that they create from taking down trees, mix it with composted leaf material, and you have something that breaks down a little faster and something that hangs around a little longer, and it doesn't crust over very much at all. Now, a lot of people don't like it because it's not perfect, and it has twigs and chunks of wood in there uh, but it is a it is a really good mulch and it is actually what i'm using on my study so 